China has been rushing to develop a vaccine for the CCP virus, but the country's scandal-plagued vaccine industry is causing concern over the quality of their products. Countries hit the hardest by the virus seem to share one common thread. Today, we take a look at the Netherlands, which has one of the higher death tolls. China once boasted about its plan to recruit foreign intelligence to its shores. But after the program came under fire by the FBI, all trace of it has vanished from Chinese search engines. A social media post by the editor-in-chief of Chinese state-controlled Global Times is sparking debate online. And over 13,000 people looking to hold the Chinese regime accountable for the pandemic. Hear from a plaintiff who's looking for the truth and justice. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The Chinese Communist Party has been using the Thousand Talents Plan to recruit large numbers of overseas scholars. But recently, all trace of the program has vanished from the Chinese Internet. Even Baidu, the biggest search engine in China, shows nothing. There's no official explanation from the Chinese regime, but some overseas Chinese language media have linked it to an FBI crackdown and an investigation of people on the participant list. The media say the Chinese regime is worried the Thousand Talents Plan list will become a most wanted list. China started the program in 2008 to recruit Chinese expats and foreign scientists to work in China so that they can bring new knowledge to China via various means. A decade later, in September 2018, the FBI began investigating the Thousand Talents plan. A Chinese scientist, Zhen Xiaoqing, a participant in the program, was arrested and prosecuted in the U.S. on charges of economic espionage and conspiring to steal sophisticated turbine designs for the Chinese regime. A biological engineer and professor in Virginia, Zhang Yiheng, was found guilty of conspiring to commit fraud, making false statements and obstruction. And the head of Harvard's chemistry department, Charles Lieber, was charged with lying to the Department of Defense about his participation in the Thousand Talents plan and covering up his acceptance of Chinese government funds. Prosecutors say Lieber also lied about his ties to the Wuhan University of Technology. Under his contract with the Wuhan University of Technology, Lieber would receive a $50,000 monthly salary plus $158,000 for living expenses and $1.5 million to establish a research lab at the university. Now, internet searches for this program show no results, but China analyst Tan Jingyuan told us the Chinese regime hasn't stopped a Thousand Talents plan. The U.S. is paying close attention to the Thousand Talents plan. Investigations are very intense, but after this period has passed, the Chinese regime may restart the program. According to Tang, even if they pause from time to time, the Chinese Communist Party will never give up on destroying the U.S. Since the Chinese Communist regime was founded, it's had a long-term goal of targeting the U.S. It regards the U.S. as an arch enemy. For all these years, no matter how the China-U.S. relations have changed, one thing remains the same. The Chinese Communist Party wants to infiltrate the U.S., destroy it, and hollow it out. This goal will not change. Tang said the Chinese regime has been using different means to achieve this goal. Tensions between the U.S. and China have never been higher. The editor-in-chief of the Global Times, a Chinese state-controlled newspaper, said given America's rising strategic ambitions and desire to target China, China needs to increase its number of nuclear warheads to over 1,000 to strengthen its nuclear deterrent. He added his online post received over 60,000 likes from Chinese netizens. One netizen described the tweet as something like a senior 50 Cent Army member would write, boosting his ego on Chinese social media so that his 50 Cent Army apprentices can like it. 50 Cent Army is a term for internet trolls who are hired by the Chinese Communist Party to manipulate public opinion. They get paid 5 Mao or about 13 U.S. cents for each post. Reportedly, they got a raise recently from 5 Mao to 7 Mao. A Reuters reporter asked the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson about the editor-in-chief's tweet. She responded, in China, he has freedom of speech. 
Yesterday, we showed a video of an empty shopping mall in Wuhan. Most of the business owners there have canceled their leases. This May 8th video shows a subway station in Wuhan. It's hard to maintain social distancing. According to local media, there are 80 percent fewer people traveling with Wuhan compared with before the outbreak. Wuhan hasn't reported any new cases in the past month, but the figure can't be verified. Many citizens are concerned about asymptomatic cases. Federal officials withdrew approval for more than 60 Chinese manufacturers exporting face masks to the U.S. The FDA found a large number of their products didn't meet quality standards. Last month, it decided to allow imports from manufacturers whose masks hadn't been tested by U.S. authorities, but had been reviewed by an independent lab. This decision has now been reversed, the FDA cutting the number of approved mask makers in China from 80 to only 14. China has been touting its success in the race to develop a vaccine for the CCP virus, commonly known as the novel coronavirus. Around 10 drug makers are at the stage of conducting human trials. Three of those companies are in China. One of them is the Wuhan Institute of Biological Products. The state-owned company said last week they are preparing for mass production of the vaccine. But for some, this doesn't sound like good news. This is He Fangmei, an ordinary Chinese mother. She says her six-year-old daughter was left with paralyzed legs after being given a vaccine made by the Wuhan Institute of Biological Products. She protested along with other victims in front of China's National Health Commission headquarters in February last year. Instead of being answered, she was arrested for picking quarrels and stirring up trouble and detained for 10 months. China's vaccine industry has been plagued by scandals. From 2007 to 2018, at least 13 major manufacturers in China were found to be producing defective vaccines causing severe side effects. In some cases, hundreds of thousands of faulty vaccines were disseminated. In 2013, a Chinese journalist made a documentary, Vaccine Wounds, highlighting nearly 100 children who became paralyzed or mentally disabled after being given bad vaccines. Authorities have generally taken little action against the offenders. In some cases, companies simply change their name and continue to operate as normal. Meanwhile, whistleblowers and parents who spoke up were often punished. For example, in 2010, a journalist revealed that over 100 children in Xiangxi province either died or became sick after being given vaccines. The article sparked huge public outcry in China. Provincial officials denied there were any problems with the vaccines. Meanwhile, parents demanding answers were threatened by authorities not to make small troubles. The journalist was fired and the chief editor at the state-run newspaper was removed. Chinese officials have publicly called vaccine quality problems a red line that cannot be crossed. Yet drug makers have repeatedly crossed that line without facing significant consequences. Why is China's pharmaceutical industry so lacking in accountability? Because all the major players are either state-owned companies or companies owned by people with close ties to high-ranking Communist Party officials. The Wuhan Institute of Biological Products that's currently developing a virus vaccine has been involved in multiple scandals. The most recent one was in 2017. Over 400,000 DTP vaccines were found to be defective. Children in China can't start school without being given the DTP vaccine cocktail for diphtheria, tetanus and whooping cough. The scandal provoked anger and panic among Chinese parents. The Wuhan company produces 80 percent of China's DTP vaccines. State authorities stated the contamination was caused by a rare accident and that 99.6 percent of China's vaccines pass inspection. Fines were imposed and company officers were allegedly punished, but no details of the actions were ever given. There has also never been reporting on what happened to the children who received the vaccines. Some Chinese officials have been removed from their positions in the wake of scandals, but very often they are later given a new position. For example, Sun Xinzi, responsible for drug safety during the DTP scandal, was in charge of food safety during the 2012 scandal involving contaminated baby formula. Chen Bingzhong, a former senior official from China's National Health Commission, said it's ironic that China claims to be leading the race to find a vaccine in the current pandemic. 
He says toxic vaccines have harmed or killed tens of thousands of children in China. Yet there's a lack of punishment, compensation or apology. So this is the precedent we are looking at here. Now China is again developing vaccines. How can it be trusted? Since being released from prison, He Fang Mei has continued seeking justice for her paralyzed daughter. On Wednesday, she walked to Beijing to appeal to the authorities. I'm so tired. My legs are shaking. On the road, I passed through many villages. I was very scared. There are graveyards on my way, and wild dogs chase me. Sai, I don't know how to describe my feeling. She also posted this photo on Twitter. The posters read, To the Wuhan Institute of Biological Products, before you sell your virus vaccines, can you do some good deeds for the children victimized by the vaccine and accumulate some virtue? A question hangs in the air in the Netherlands about its government's attitude toward China's rulers. The ambiguity started as early as last year. So what is the relationship between the two countries and what's its significance now? NTD Xu and Rong has the story. In March, the Netherlands joined the countries in rejecting medical supplies made in China. The Dutch health ministry was forced to recall 600,000 face masks from the hospitals. Their statement said the masks shipped from China had a KN95 certificate, but they did not meet quality standards. China's foreign ministry spokesperson reacted the following week. She claimed the Netherlands had ordered the wrong masks, saying they're not for surgical use, stating the Chinese manufacturer informed the Netherlands before the masks were sent. The Dutch government did not respond publicly until China's premier had a phone call with the Dutch prime minister in the same week. Prime Minister Mark Rutte said he thanked China for its, quote, solidarity and all the support it provides with high-quality medical equipment. It's not the first time the Netherlands has displayed an ambivalent attitude towards China. The Dutch government has been struggling with how to deal with China and still is. In 2019, Dutch security agency AIVD warned the Netherlands' high-tech sector about corporate espionage by the CCP. In the same year, Chinese-founded U.S. tech firm Ixtal was found guilty of stealing IP from Dutch company ASML, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in losses. ASML is the world's leading manufacturer of chip-making equipment, and China is an important market for them. The incident in 2015 involved two former Chinese employees from ASML. After leaving ASML, they co-founded a competitor company called Ixtal, based in California. A year after Ixtal was founded, it started luring away ASML's clients, including Samsung. Ixtal's parent company is based in Beijing. According to research from Dutch newspaper Financiel Dagblad, the Chinese ministry had given subsidies to the parent company. The subsidies were meant for a project to boost China's position in the chip machinery market, of which ASML is the current market leader. The ASML case increased widespread public concern about using technology from mainland China. The Dutch House of Representatives immediately called on the government to ban Huawei equipment in the construction of its 5G networks. The U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands had repeatedly warned about Huawei's security risks, but in April of the same year, the Royal Dutch Telecom provider KPN still decided to collaborate with Huawei, saying it will only use Huawei in non-critical parts of the network. While debate continued in the House of Representatives, the Dutch government released a China strategy the next month. They said the strategy adopted a constructive and critical position on China in terms of security and technology, but it did not state its position on Huawei's participation. When the reporter asked the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs why Huawei wasn't mentioned, Minister Steph Bloch said, It makes sense not to advertise for any company in a strategy. The Netherlands has been China's second largest trade partner within the EU for most of the past 17 years. China often calls the Netherlands the portal to Europe. Because the Dutch hold the largest seaport in Europe and third largest airport in terms of cargo transportation, the Netherlands became an important location for China's Belt and Road Initiative. In 2016, the Chengdu-Tilburg-Rotterdam Express was officially opened as part of China's massive infrastructure Belt and Road Initiative. 
partnered with Dutch company GVT Group of Logistics, it became the fastest and only direct freight railway from China to the Netherlands, connecting Tilburg, the logistic portal in Noord Brabant, to Rotterdam to China several times a week. Together with the Belt and Road Initiative, China's largest state-owned shipping and logistics company slowly took over Europe. China Costco Shipping is a major investor in European container terminals. It has stakes in container terminals in the Netherlands, Belgium, Spain, Italy, and Greece. In 2016, China's Costco Pacific bought a 35% stake in Rotterdam's Euromax container terminal for $143 million. The Belt and Road Initiative has opened a pathway to China, but also brought the Dutch an increasing trade deficit. Local media reported in 2018 that all containers from China were full, but containers to China were only filled about 40 percent. Statistics from Netherlands CBS show that, from 2016 to 2018, Dutch exports to China grew from $11 billion to $13 billion, while imports from China grew from $38 billion to $42 billion, causing a deficit growth of about 20 percent. Following the Tilburg Express, Dutch logistics company Neuler opened a new freight route in 2018 from Amsterdam to China's Zhejiang province. A transportation consultant said in an interview with Dutch radio and television broadcaster Evrotos that there are also drawbacks to the Belt and Road Initiative, that it will give China even more economic and political power. You have to comply with Chinese rules and Chinese law, the highest authority being the court in Beijing. These are different rules than we are used to with free trade in the West after World War II. The China-Dutch relation is especially important for the Netherlands consumer market. The Netherlands-China strategy says the Dutch government has been naive towards China in terms of trade. The country is trying to find a new balance in Sino-Dutch relations and hopes China will become an important customer. Western countries are starting to reassess their ties with the CCP since the virus spread throughout the world, not only rethinking trade but also the frailty of human life. Meanwhile, Beijing is trying to leverage its trade relations to gain dominance in the world. Though the Netherlands, with a population of 17 million, has one of the highest death rates from the CCP virus, parliamentary debates have not emphasized holding China accountable. Yet, since the outbreak, the Netherlands' relationship with the regime has been changing. As of today, our office name into Netherlands Office Taipei. On April 28th, the Dutch delegation in Taiwan changed its name from Netherlands Trade and Investment Office to Netherlands Office Taipei, which is Taiwan's capital city. The same day, China's ambassador to the Netherlands sent out a solemn reminder to the Dutch government, warning about issues in adhering to the One China principle, saying the new name will hurt Sino-Dutch relations. China's foreign ministry also requested the Netherlands strictly abide by the One China principle, correct wrong practices, and take concrete actions to safeguard the overall situation of bilateral relations. Since then, China has been threatening to withhold medical supplies from the Netherlands. A Dutch researcher from the Klingendale China Center says, although the Netherlands depends on China for medical devices in the fight against the virus, it will not be beneficial for China to argue, while it is already taking a lot of criticism as a result of how the regime has handled the virus crisis. Reporting by Xu Wenrong, NTD News. And in other news, top officials from the U.S. and China spoke on the phone last night. Among the topics discussed, the Phase 1 trade deal signed in January. This as tensions surged between Washington and Beijing over the origins of the CCP virus or coronavirus. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer spoke to Chinese Vice Premier Liu He over the phone last Thursday. They addressed trade relations between the two countries a topic that's been largely overshadowed in recent months by the virus pandemic. According to the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, both sides agreed that in spite of the current global health emergency, both countries fully expect to meet their obligations under the agreement in a timely manner. The office added both nations also agreed to maintain communication. Statements from both countries revealed the officials also spoke about the economy and public health issues. The U.S. and China, two of the world's largest economies, have been locked in a bitter trade war since 2018, raising tariffs on billions of dollars of each other's imports until tensions appeared to relax after signing the Phase 1 deal. But the reprieve was short-lived, as concerns over Beijing's handling of the virus erupted. 
The two countries have not yet announced a timeline for further trade negotiations. In a class action lawsuit, over 13,000 people are looking to hold China accountable for the pandemic. Reasons for suing range from financial harm to the loss of life. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from a plaintiff who said he wants the truth and justice for the aunt he lost. What sounds best to you tonight? 86-year-old Lenora always wore plaid. I like food, period. Due to growing health complications, she and her twin Loretta were admitted to a nursing home in Washington state. But earlier this year, the CCP virus invaded that facility, infecting them both. Lenora died, and now their nephew, Ray Bodine from Texas, has joined over 13,000 plaintiffs in a lawsuit looking to hold China financially accountable for the pandemic. Really, you know, uh, Miguel, we did it to find the truth uh, because this pandemic has affected all of us, all of our families. They're my aunts, they're, you know, your brothers and sisters. Uh, so I, I th feel it's very important for us to find the truth in all this. Lenora died on March 23rd and turned out positive in a post-mortem. Loretta tested positive for the virus on the 10th, but since then she's been symptom free. They used to be Catholic nuns, and although Loretta suffers from dementia, Ray said she has some recollection of what happened to her sister. You know, but just with the, the side effects of dementia in speaking with Loretta, you know, sometimes she understands that uh, her twin Lenora is now with the Lord. And then there's some days that uh, she believes that, that Lenora is uh, just out for a while. Ray joined the lawsuit after hearing about it from his brother in Florida. There, the Berman Law Group is heading the case, accusing China of deceptively downplaying the outbreak. They say up to thousands of potential plaintiffs are inquiring daily, wanting to hold China accountable. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. California easing up on some retailers today, but restaurants remain closed. And one sheriff there publicly announcing he won't enforce the lockdown orders. In California today, retailers are starting up their businesses in a new way. With adaptations, all with modifications, but all with an eye on turning the page and moving into a new phase in terms of our economic recovery. For many stores, it's curbside pickup only for now. It's a tactic many states have adopted in attempt to strike a balance between a healthy society and recovering economy. Still under stricter measures, restaurants there still can't reopen. Those that do now risk losing their liquor license. But enforcing the rules may get more difficult. That's after Sheriff Chad Bianco publicly announced he refuses to enforce the order. He commands the second largest sheriff's department in California. Moving to other states, Hawaii's police force is cracking down on travelers. Tourists who don't self-quarantine are being arrested. And elsewhere, Maryland and New Jersey are reopening beaches today. Parks and beaches, uh, while you've got to manage the distancing and the capacities, are easier lifts to manage than, say, congregating closely inside, and that's still a ways off. New Jersey is the second hardest hit in the nation, second only to New York. Despite that, the governor says his state is making enormous progress. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. As global supply chains fracture and the threat of food shortages looms, the president wants to strengthen the domestic fish industry. America imports over 85 percent of its seafood, making it heavily reliant on countries like China for supply. President Trump signed an executive order Thursday to strengthen the United States fishing industry. The U.S. currently imports over 85 percent of its seafood. This includes fish that are caught in the U.S. but then shipped abroad for processing before being imported back again. This has resulted in an annual seafood trade deficit of more than $10.4 billion. The president now wants to build the domestic industry to help the economy and American workers. There is also the issue of food security. Global lockdowns have highlighted how fragile supply chains can be. China is currently the world's largest seafood producer and supplies much of what Americans eat. U.S. officials want to reduce the country's reliance on China after the Chinese regime's deceitful actions during the pandemic. The U.S.'s largest seafood trade partner, China ranks worst among the countries producing illegal and unregulated seafood. The president's order will target this type of illegal behavior. It will also hold imported seafood to the same quality standards as domestic produce, safeguarding the health of the American people. 
In our business roundup, both the U.S. and Canada suffer record job losses in April. Uber loses $2.9 billion and offloads its bike and scooter business. And Google employees are told to work from home for the rest of the year. Data released today shows both the U.S. and Canada suffered record job losses in April. The U.S. unemployment rate jumped from 4.4 percent in March to 14.7 percent in April, the biggest jump in a single month on record. And two million jobs were lost in Canada, the biggest loss on record. An additional 1.1 million were temporarily laid off. Google employees have been told to work from home for the remainder of the year. It will open its offices for those who need to come in in June or July. Facebook made a similar announcement earlier today. Uber stock jumped today, even after announcing a $2.9 billion loss yesterday. The company's CEO says the company is already seeing a recent uptick in business. It's cutting $1 billion of costs, though, and has also offloaded its scooter and bike sharing business. Oil prices are up 5% today. It's the second week of gains as lockdowns are lifted and demand increases. The number of rigs operating in the U.S. has hit a record low. They're trying to save costs and also keep prices high by reducing supply. And tragically, a five-year-old boy passed away in New York City on Thursday. The child died from an illness linked to the CCP virus. New York Governor Cuomo said health officials are looking into whether the virus is a bigger threat to children than they thought. On Thursday, a five-year-old boy passed away from a rare complication caused by the CCP virus. New York Governor Cuomo said his state's health officials are examining whether children might be at a higher risk than previously thought. Uh, This would be uh, really painful news and would open up an entirely different chapter because I can't tell you how many people I spoke to who took peace and solace in the fact that children were not getting infected. The governor said there have been 73 reported cases in the state of children exposed to the virus becoming severely ill. The children exhibited symptoms of Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome with inflammation in their blood vessels. So caution to uh, all people who again may have believed that their child couldn't be affected by COVID. Governor Cuomo noted it's clear that an unequal amount of new cases in the state are coming from minority communities. Cuomo reports that out of the 21 zip codes with the highest rate of virus hospitalizations, 20 of them have greater than average black and or Latino populations. After closing down schools and businesses, the governor has asked hospitals to look at the new cases coming in to find out what they can learn about the current challenge the state is facing. Under the lockdown measures, many people are finding peace in their vegetable patch. Our UK correspondent spoke with Londoners who are making the most of their land during lockdown. Everyone is so grateful that we can come down here. The slowness of life, the simple things. There will be a lot of beans, so we basically share it with each other, with the neighbours. An oasis in London suburbs, members of this community feel like they're together, even though they're standing apart. You're actually doing something for the community, you're doing something, you're growing vegetables, helping out to each other. Uh, it's still a, you know, a sociable place to be, even with the distancing rules. This is one of the many allotments or community gardens scattered around London, where gardeners can grow their own food. It's really very, very good. If I hadn't got the allotment, I would go completely bonkers. 90-year-old Brian enjoys a visit from his daughter. This garden has kept him going during the UK's lockdown measures. You're very dependent on the weather. I mean, we're lucky today. But this is good now. Sun and rain, excellent. Looking after your piece of land takes time and effort. It's hard, hard work. 60% of people fail. So out of the 10 people I let plots to, six give up within three months. But more people are taking an interest in growing their own food. The number of people on their waiting list has gone up to 30 since last summer, with interest continuing during the lockdown. The majority of the plots here are looking really good this year, partly because of the lockdown, but um, partly because we've got a waiting list and we can put more pressure on people to get their finger out. Some people, they just don't uh, cultivate the whole of their plot. Once harvest season arrives, all of that hard work will come to fruition. You, know, you can see up here all the peaches are settled in. I give loads away. I mean, I do get pleasure in giving stuff away. There's more to life than just trying to make a considerable amount of money. With no chance of developers building blocks of apartments anytime soon, 
people will be cultivating their patches of land here long after the end of the lockdown. Jane Worrell, NTG News, London. The European Union says its travel ban will stay for at least another month, and when they do reopen, they'll start with internal borders, and the change will be slow. The European Union executive announced it will keep curbs on travel to the continent in place for another 30 days. While the move doesn't help tourism, the EU's Home Affairs Commissioner says open borders will come when the pandemic is under control. Social distancing signs are showing up around the world, from simple spray-painted circles to bright pink floor stickers. Emerging from weeks under lockdown, people now face a range of new measures. These markings appear on shop floors, city pavements and train or tram platforms the world over. And in Turkey, caravan sales are surging as people gear up for a summer season overshadowed by the outbreak. One caravan manufacturer says it's getting orders from places they never expected, like South Korea and Norway. With air travel more like a flight of fancy, wishful travelers are seeing the upsides of camping. With lockdowns in place, families are low on options in keeping themselves fit and entertained. British cyclist Pete Mitchell is solving the problem by letting his kids be a part of his workout routine. Push-ups, squats, planking and lunging, it's nothing out of the ordinary. But getting the kids to help brightens this athlete's workout. Now peppered with giggles and laughs, it's a win-win. Mitchell stays fit, spending time with his kids and the kids have a great time too. Some unexpected sweetness in a changing world. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. This Sunday, here on this channel, we bring you a special report on Wall Street's ties to the Chinese Communist Party, a pandemic impacting the world's people, millions infected with the virus, and one country's cover-up. This Sunday, we take a look at what risks we've long overlooked and what solutions can we find from the wisdom of our founding fathers. Tune in at 9 p.m. on Sunday to find out.